Welcome everyone to the second Q&A session. This session will include all of today's speakers. For our Southside analysts, let me remind you about two items. First, please limit yourself to one question only as a courtesy to everyone else in the queue. And second, please remember to unmute your microphone and turn on your video after we place you into the live call. With that, let's start the Q&A session. Please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. And our first question will come from a Charles Sutania at Credit Suisse. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, maybe a question uh, for Raghav on, on the CNS business. Uh, Raghav, you talked about uh, a lot of things that uh, are gonna help improve the margins over time. Uh, you're starting from a very low base of uh, minus 2% uh, last year. Uh, I, I'm just trying to understand what's gonna be the biggest uh, Delta uh, driver for improvement in margins. You have quite an ambitious target of uh, reaching 10% over time. Uh, We've seen with one of your peer group companies that uh, margin improvement in, uh, in in this part of the business is uh, proving to be challenging. So I'm just trying to understand, like, uh, if we were to pick one or two items of all the measures that you're trying to take, uh, what can we focus on to give us confidence on that uh, big improvement? Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. So thank you very much for the question. And uh, it's a good question, by the way. So first of all, as I talked about in my presentation, we are really focusing on five key areas of the market that are really growing fast and where our customers are looking for us to create value in. And that's 5G core, it's digital operations, it's private wireless, it's AI-based services, and it's in the managed security. And you will see that this market in itself in 2021 grows at 10% on a Kager basis and will grow up into 15% in a Kager basis as we go forward. Today, our business mix in that particular segment is about 37% of our business sits in that segment. And as we go into 2023, almost 67% of our business will come from those emerging opportunities. And that is going to be a big driver for our margin improvement growth all the way from 21 to 23. In addition to that, obviously we are driving, you know, a lot of efficiencies we are driving remotization of our services and our care. We are building, consolidating our workforce into centers of excellence to drive productivity, uh, as well as um, you know, delivering better customer satisfaction. We are digitizing processes, uh, which will provide us more agility and response. And these will be the key drivers you know, that will really drive our margin improvements on the bottom line all the way from 21 to 23. And we will continue to grow faster than the market in each one of these years as we go forward. Thank you, Achal. And for our next question, we'll go to Sami Sakramis from Nordia. Sami, please go ahead. Uh, hello, thanks for taking my uh, question. Uh, this will go to uh, Tommy Uito at Mobile uh, Networks. Uh, can you help us uh, understand why the EBIT margin target stands at only 5 to 8% uh, for 23, uh, following all the planned measures as you were already at that uh, level last year? And then when looking at your close peer Ericsson, uh, they were at 15% uh, uh, excluding IPR revenues last year and are targeting even higher levels going forward. What explains uh, such a big uh, difference uh, in, in margin level? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Sami. So, in in my presentation, I, I shared with you why why we moved from last year's uh, eight percent uh, to around break even this year. So, from minus one to positive two percent, and uh, most of this is is due to the headwind suffered in North America uh, last year. Uh, and then part of it is because our four G volumes in China are going down, but are not replaced by the same amount of five G. Uh, in China, and and then partly because we have this increased R and investment in 5G, so that takes us to around break even, which is a tough starting point. And uh, this is the year of the reset. Uh, and then going forward, as of right now, uh, there are many levers that we are pulling to get to the five to to eight percent. So so the margin improvement comes uh, in 21 to 22 to 23 from many sources. So we have 
volume increase because we expect to continue to, to win uh, more new customers and increase share in incumbent accounts in the CSP space uh, because of the growth in the private wireless segment, uh, because of co cost of goods sold reduction, because we continue to reduce product and services cost with SOCs, design for serviceability, digitalization of the service delivery. Uh, comes from mix because we'll be more selective on low margin deployment services business. Um, comes from central cost of sales because we're making operational and quality improvements that uh, help reduce fixed production overheads and other items like uh, you know warranty, access and obsolescence. And then of course, OPEX, uh, because we will be reducing cost in, in support functions and administration and so on in non R&D OPEX. And uh, so, this year is a, is a tough starting point, and uh, this is the this is the objective and, and honest and transparent plan that we have going forward. And of course, beyond 23, the ambition is to to get to 10 percent or better operating margin. Thank you. Thank you, Sami. Yes, thank you, Sami. Uh, let's go to Frederick Littell, Frederick Littell at Danske Bank for our next question. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking my uh, question. Uh, thanks for all the interesting presentations from you all. Uh, I, I could could I stay with Tommy maybe for for a uh, second question here. You you described the the falling volumes uh, in China on 4G and that you are not really participating to the same extent on 5G and that was something that uh, sort of happened during the course of 2020. What do you see are your possibilities to, to go sort of come back in China? If you want to come back in China, is there another situation now or is it so that, you know, that decision is complete for, for the long term? I, I felt that you alluded to that in your presentation that you, you, you keep a foot in, in China uh, because it's a very advanced market. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, th thank you, Frederick. Uh, good question. And so let, let's first look at the starting point. So. Actually, we had we had never made a decision that we would not participate in in 5G radio access in China, and and in fact we did participate and we did win some market share in 5G with China Mobile and then the the joint venture of China Te Telecom China Unicom, even if of course much uh, smaller market share than than what we have had in 4G, so we have supplied our 2.5 gigahertz 5G to China Mobile and, and 3.5 gigahertz to CTC CUC. Uh, both in macro and small cells, uh, including some important cities like Shanghai. Um, but at the time of the central purchasing rounds, the first ones, we were still in the middle of the product turnaround, and we didn't really have fully competitive product for the Chinese customers' needs, especially in the art of bandwidth. And when you don't score well in the technical evaluation in China, then you have to go to and, and give very significant discounts to secure share, which is why we decided to take very little share at the time. But that was back then. Um, let's talk about today and the future. Mm. We are participating in the next central purchasing rounds of 5G in China with China Mobile, uh, China Telecom, China Unicom, as well as China Broadcast Network or CBN. Because like I said, uh, China is a big market. There are in important innovations there. Our product is more competitive after the last two years of turnaround and continues to improve through this year. Uh, Picking an example, so the 700 megahertz 5G product uh, offered to CBN has actually to a good extent been developed by our R&D in Hangzhou and Nanjing. We are the first supplier who has completed the tests in 26 gigahertz millimeter wave with MIT, the ministry. So we are uh, trying to, to increase our share there. But this said, it is of course challenging to increase share in the latter central purchasing rounds when most of the market share has been awarded in the first central purchasing rounds. I, I hope I was able to add color to and, and answer your question properly. Absolutely, thank you very much. Very good answer, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you, uh, Frederick. And for our next question, let's move to Rob Sanders at Deutsche Bank. Yeah, hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, just more questions for Tommy, I'm afraid. Um, could I just ask about the Verizon impact um, and and a bit about margins. So on the Verizon impact, is there a kind of residual services impact uh, into next year uh, from that contract? Is there any kind of residual nagging impact from services revenue falling away? Um, and then on the margins by region, typically, you know, the US was the most profitable region, but you've been highlighting more aggressive pricing. Presumably then the European margins 
are improving given the Huawei's issues. Is that what you're seeing, a, a kind of equalization of margin by region, or, or even perhaps that European margins are now uh, ahead of, of the US? If you could just give some commentary there, that would be great. Thank you very much. All right, <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Actually, there were three questions, but I'm, I'm of course super happy to answer all three. So first on, um, so, so most of the impact of the, of the headwind that we suffered in, in North America is, is already visible uh, in, the, in, in the quarters of this year in, in 2021. Uh, so the impact is, is already visible fully um, or mostly. And, uh, and going forward, we will, of course, have very important business in, in North America with, with many carriers. So earlier this year, we announced a five-year deal with the T-Mobile USA in low bands and mid bands and millimeter wave. And today we announced the expansion deal with AT&T in the US, including the very important C-band. Um, and, and like I said, uh, you know, we can indeed offset some of the earlier mentioned uh, headwind uh, with the winds that we have scored uh, in the rest of the world over the past two years. Now, when you, you refer to, um, to, to the US pricing, uh, the market has been more competitive uh, during the, the, the last rounds of, uh, of deal making than, than, than perhaps before, but uh, we have been able to, to secure our our share of the business and, and, and move, move ahead. In terms of European margins, uh, yeah, so, some of these, these operators, uh, some of these new customers we have won or increased market share that we have won, has, this has happened partly in Europe, but it has also happened in other parts of the world, like uh, uh, Japan, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, Canada, for that matter. And, um, and uh, we have, According to Deloro, for one, we have uh, gotten to basically a tight number one position in Europe uh, in 5G market share and grown our market share and, and, uh, and now tied with, with Ericsson and Huawei in, in Europe. Market is, of course, very competitive. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Um, next, let's go to the line of Frank Mao from BNB. I mean, for, yes. So thank you for taking the question. Um, uh, a bit of a follow-up on, uh, on, on, on the, the footprint in North America there, but, but first uh, I would like to just ask about uh, your uh, CSP market outlook, uh, which seems uh, perhaps a bit cautious uh, given um, you know, the comparison at least uh, to, to, to other mar market uh, researchers such as Delora, for instance, Indicating that in 2020 there was you know pretty pretty good momentum coming out of the year 2021. Uh, I think they say some four percent growth. So go, looking looking then forward to 2023, um, given the flatness you see in the CSP uh, market, um, what are the headwinds you see there on the market level, and um, and also with the AT&T contract in. In, in the pocket, I think Tommy alluded to the fact that you've been able to secure your share of the business, as, uh, as you put it. Uh, could you uh, confirm that you expect no further material footprint loss in North America, uh, given this? And finally, if I may just um, ask about the, 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 what you see are the main swing factors uh, driving the quite wide range there of 10 to uh, to 13 percent on the more more of a group level. I guess that was more of a, a group level question, but uh, but anyway, uh, thank you. Was the uh, was the market share question the market growth question? It sounded like you were alluding to mobile uh, networks uh, specifically. Was is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So then maybe Tommy Tommy takes that one, and then uh, then uh, Marco will take the the, the second part uh, part the ten to thirteen percent part of the question. All right. Yeah. Let's do so. All right. Yeah. So um, first uh, the market size, and uh, so indeed what what we have shown in this presentation as uh, as our estimate for the uh, addressable market uh, development for for mobile networks. For the product and, and services, we said we, we estimate a one uh, one percent growth CAGR uh, for the next couple of years. That's of course with the with the with the current uh, FX rate. Deloro, for instance, they they use constant currency, and 
they, they, they report in the USD and, and that's a bit more than 2%. So there's a, there's a small difference there. Um, if we think about the, the news from the US uh, from last week and some of the announcements made there, uh, we are still in the process of analyzing all of those news uh, from the US uh, from last week. But, uh, but uh, it is important to note that for one, Delora, which you refer to, they have also restated the market value for 2020 and upped it significantly, which will then have an impact on, on the growth rate looking at uh, 21 and, and onwards. And, uh, and then it's good to remember that the C-band deployment uh, in the US, that will accelerate during the second half of the year uh, because the C-band spectrum becomes available only, only from the end of the year. And, and then in terms of the, the market share, so, so uh, indeed, uh, our, our uh, product, uh, product uh, competitiveness has improved over the past, uh, past two years. And that's why we believe that, uh, that, any further, uh, that the risk of any further major market share loss or footprint loss, uh, that risk uh, has significantly reduced. And then what comes to the uh, swing factors in uh, 10 to 13, of course, market development is very important here and also looking into different geographies, the mix, product mix as well. Um, and and it's, it is important that, that as, as a technology company that we have the product leadership. So that, that is definitely a, a factor here. But also if you think the geographies, if you are uh, present in, in markets, markets where you have good margins, um, so that, that mix is extremely important. Uh, so there's a lot of different factors that, that are a little bit unknown yet um, when we come to 2023. Of course, uh, today's uh, deal as well when it comes to AT&T and, and, um, and, and what we have won already in, in US is very uh, comforting as well. Uh, but still, uh, it is some way to go to 2023. I, I would say that I, I fully agree with, with uh, Marco. And then I would say that it, it, it actually boils down very much to one one question, and that is the what we in the in the release today call market development. Of course, it, it means our top line development. Our our guidance is that by 2023 we want to go faster than the market. But when we were when you were listening to the business group president's presentation, I hope you actually actually could capture the optimism and uh, and uh, uh, enthusiasm there uh, when they were describing their uh, their plans and uh, when we are saying that we want to grow faster than the market uh, of course that room so gives a lot of space and room to maneuver as to where we will finally finally land and, and uh, we roughly understand that we believe now where the opex will go we start to have an understanding of where the cross margin will go and then there is a pretty good leverage if the if the top line goes grows uh, uh, faster than uh, than uh, we would have in the more conservative uh, uh, plans so that would be the most uh, kind of uh, most uh, visible thing between the 10 and, and 13 uh, percent of the most important driver between the two extremes thank you that's very clear thank you so much for your question frank for our next question let's go to the line of alex Peturk at sg Yes, hi. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I actually have two. Um, uh, the first one uh, will be for, for Tommy. Um, uh, just on the, the phasing of the uh, impact that you're going to see in the US, you, you'll have quite a painful impact there this year, as we can see at the margins. So is, is that going to come through immediately from Q1? Or you know, how does it develop in, a, in terms of linearity over the year? When is the, 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 the point of maximum pain here? Uh, and then a uh, second one for Federico, uh, if you could zero in on optics a little bit. Um, uh, do you see uh, market share opportunities, market share gains opportunities? Um, you, some of your competitors are saying that uh, uh, Huawei is obviously losing share there as well on security concerns. So, so do you see anything coming through there? And um, why haven't you actually been able to capitalize on that uh, up until now? Thanks a lot. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, indeed, uh, this uh, this headwind uh, that we suffered uh, in, in North America, uh, that is uh, something that uh, where the impact uh, is immediately available, uh, uh, visible. Uh, it is uh, it is having uh, having an, most of that impact is immediately uh, impacting the, the quarters Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 this year. Okay. Yeah. And as for 
as for optics, uh, yeah, we are, we're having a good ride in the last uh, months. Actually, we are we expect uh, to show market share growth in the next uh, reports. Uh, we have had in some markets uh, growth uh, in the reports of the analysis, Omtia and, and Deloro, but uh, it has to materialize in revenues before they can report that. Uh, we have several important wins in the last uh, months of uh, 2020 and in the first months of 21. So yeah, we expect uh, to see some market share growth. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. And now let's go to the line of Sandeep Deshpande from JP Morgan. Yeah, hi, thank you for letting me on. Uh, I have two quick questions. Uh, firstly, uh, 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 I mean, in the mobile networks market for Tommy, I mean, your product is more uh, competitive today uh, and you still have all that 4G footprint at that customer that you've lost in the US. So is there no possibility that you that the better product will allow you to keep some at least of that footprint in radio that you might lose? And my second quick question is uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the, the infrastructure market, uh, sorry, uh, the, the IP market, I mean, in 2023 or 2024, you might lose some of the business associated with that Microsoft deal. So uh, is there other uh, business which is going to come through which will compensate that? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. And uh, while I, I cannot speak on behalf of Verizon uh, or share any details of any ongoing discussion that we may have with them, but what I can say is that Verizon remains a, a strategically important customer to all of Nokia, including mobile networks, including my business group. Um, Verizon has a lot of Nokia radio e equipment in its network. You can see it with your bare eye. And uh, we are working closely with Verizon to, to support them in, in their 5G network evolution. And uh, now that our product competitiveness has improved and continues to improve, we will obviously keep looking for ways to, uh, to do more business uh, with Verizon. So thank you, Sandeep, uh, for your question about the Microsoft agreement. So, so let me start by saying that uh, we have successfully generated recurring revenue stream from most uh, major <clears throat> mobile device players uh, in the past years. So we have a number of deals that are ending and coming up for renewal over the next five years. At the same time, we keep on expanding our licensing base to grow uh, in other segments. Uh, Microsoft is just one of our licensees and their agreement and its term is taken into account in our current guidance. Thank you, Sandeep. For our next question, let's move to Daniel Derberg at Handelsbanken. Thank you so much for taking my question, gentlemen. And uh, I, I think I have a question to Nishant. Uh, and that would be on the network as a service, uh, i.e. the wave free you talked about. Um, how fast or do we have any timeline when we should expect this to, to, to start to, to um, materialize? And also what you see on the competitive side, do you see a big risk that you compete with your own customers in terms of uh, the private network for enterprises? Thank you. Great question. Um, so two, two answers to that. The first answer, uh, it depends on the domain we're looking at. There is already quite a bit of discussion uh, with respect to some of the cloud and uh, network services business that we have to evolve that towards as a service model. And our expectation is that that impetus would just continue. Uh, with respect to specifically around private wireless, uh, we see, I mean, like I talked about, the two waves, the next two waves, when we move towards a model where it's about software, it's actually our conviction that towards as a service would be a rather quick move after that because the industry expects that. We've seen that in the IT industry, for example, and those models are fairly successful. Uh, when it comes to uh, the, the go-to-market for our uh, private wireless, uh, we will look at both models. We'll work through our CSP customers and enable them and go to enterprises ourselves directly where it's more apt. But I would also probably give the floor uh, to Raghav and invite him to make a comment on that. Yeah, sure, Nishant. I, I think uh, the key thing of 
winning in the enterprise space because we operate in multiple verticals and we've got a dedicated sales team <clears> and we build expertise of use cases that are necessary to solve in each one of those cases. And we combine that with technology to really build the value proposition. Uh, and that proposition is then taken you know, through partners as Nishan talked about through our CSV partners or directly or through industrial partners to bring the overall solution. The enterprise world is a very, very large domain. Uh, it requires, it's a very large digital ecosystem of solutions that you need to bring together. Uh, and so you have to have a very flexible approach, but you do have to have deep segment knowledge about the problems that you're trying to solve for our customers. And so we are well placed in that in terms of being able to have a team that is dedicated to this space, working in conjunction with our partners to drive the joint value proposition forward. Thank you Thank so much. You, Thank you, Daniel. For our next question, let's move to the line of Richard Kramer from Arete. Thanks very much. Uh, I have one for Yeni and one for Federico. Um, Yeni, we know you've been sort of deep in the middle of some very contentious litigation in the auto space, and you've got some additional angles with Avanci. Can you help us size both the costs that you're currently facing and the overall pool or what you see as the addressable market for uh, technology's income from that autos market? And equally with brand licensing, I think it's fair to say that HMD has, has not been a huge success. Do you see a, a brand licensing being remaining a material component of technologies over time. And then for Federico, how are you planning to, how shall I say, sort of replace, if possible, the sort of driving forces behind the IP routing and optics business when Basil and Sri move on at the end of the year? Thanks. So thank you for the question. So I start with the, uh, the automotive uh, dispute outlook. So first of all, yes, we have ongoing litigations uh, with Daimler in Germany. Uh, overall, we feel very strong uh, about the, our position uh, in that dispute, and we hope to be able to resolve that matter soon. Uh, I think the numbers are reflected in the numbers that we are disclosing uh, quarterly, so, so I will not go deeper into that. When it comes to the, the, the growth opportunities in the automotive segment, we actually, I provided some, uh, some numbers in the presentation today, but, but it, it, is, it is a very meaningful growth opportunity for us, us going forward. And, and we are actually quite, quite, uh, quite happy about the, the, the sort of the, the, the start that we have had with the program. Uh, secondly, on, on brand licensing, so HMD Global uh, remains our main brand partner in the, in the space of, uh, smartphones. Uh, it is an important business for us, and, and this is something that we, we, we do see as, as, as a significant part of our business also going forward. Federico? Okay. Yeah, as, as for your question on, uh, on how to replace Basil and Sri, uh, listen, uh, in the end, Basil and Sri are two people that I know for 15 years, and I have a high respect uh, for them. They are still working with us, as you know, uh, helping us with the strategy, and, and not only that, with uh, to deliver the the great roadmap we had in front of us for the next quarters. Uh, but there is a team behind. Uh, there is a, a great team behind. So, in fact, you see that uh, when I had to appoint the leaders of my new organization, I took leaders uh, coming from the from the from the ranks uh, into that, those positions and they were part of the success of the IP routing and, and, and optical division so far. So I'm not worried because uh, the, the talent pool that I have is uh, is good enough and, uh, and the team is stepping up. Thank you, Richard. For our next question, let's go to Andrew Gardner from Barclays. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Tommy, in, in his presentation, gave a, a sort of a longer term target for mobile networks, indicating that there was still some expansion to come beyond the 2023 timeframe, um, speaking of 10% plus. I'm just wondering for Federico and Raghav in NI and cloud network services, uh, the margins that you guys have set out for 2023, is that sort of almost an end point or a sustainable level? Um, if not, what would your aspirational margin targets be beyond that um, timeframe? Thank you. Uh, the one I can go first or? 
Yeah, please. Uh, okay, thanks, Federico. So first of all, we are only guiding, you know, to 2023, and as you can see on our, you know, operating margin walk, this consistently improves, you know, relative to each year on a very consistent basis. And so 2023 is not an endpoint for us. We will look. We are not guiding anything, but I very much expect to continue to grow healthy margins going beyond 2023. We will continue to look at market conditions and all of that. But at this point in time, you know, our guidance is still 2023. Uh, but we are confident that we'll continue that journey after that. And my answer to you is uh, very much in line with what Raghav just said. Of course, uh, we are guiding nine to 12 percent for 2023 for NI business. Uh, of course, uh, we're, we're constantly looking for opportunities to improve. We're constantly challenging ourselves uh, if uh, that is good or, or we can do more. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we cannot talk today about uh, aspirations, but, uh, but the guidance is what it is. And, but we will continue looking for, look for more improvements, of course. And if I, if I just before we take the next question, I would just like to confirm this from group point of view. For example, if we take uh, Federico's business, as we have said earlier, and as many of you know, the IP routing business is already well into double digits. Optical network has been low, but it's now clearly uh, improving. Fixed networks has some pretty attractive tra 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 trajectories going on as well as also, also summary networks. And you heard what Tommy said about his ambition. And when you then see what some of these cloud players have been able to achieve, through various types of uh, as a service business models, uh, you will understand that uh, that uh, Ragav's ambition will not stop at the 2023 either. On the group level, 21 to 23 bridge, I mean the corridor that we are given, it increases by, in a way, average one and a half percentage point per year. I think that is a pretty good uh, trajectory. It's too early today to comment anything that will happen after 2023 but as you as you can see we have no intention to stop there thank you very much thank you andrew uh, for our next question let's go to peter kurt nielsen from abg hi peter please go ahead hi peter kurt oh did we lose peter kurt I'm on here. Sorry, sorry, Matt. There was an issue here. Um, a question related to enterprises, please. Judging from your comment, uh, confident comments on your position in, in, in enterprises, it sounds like you believe you have the necessary skills in-house. Uh, is that correct? Or, or, or would you anticipate uh, needing to make some bold on acquisitions in order to strengthen your position in the enterprise area? And if I can just follow up on the private wireless, um, a private wireless outlook um, for Tommy, I guess, uh, please, you talked about the two sales models, the direct one and the one via uh, CSPs. Is there any material uh, difference in profitability for Nokia uh, in these two um, uh, uh, sales channels, sort of respectively, please? Thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll take the uh, first question, uh, you know, right up front. So first of all, I think, uh, you know, we, as I talked about it earlier, we are building with our dedicated sales organization and domain experts. We are building clear vertical expertise, you know, on the what our customers are looking for in the areas of industrial automation, which are very, very specific, you know, to a vertical. But there are many, many use cases. You know, we'll bring some use cases. Uh, the customer will develop some use cases, and there will be use cases that will come from the broader ecosystem. To say that we have all the expertise, that's not a fair comment. But do we have the right expertise to bolt on to the technology leadership we have in the private wireless and other aspects of enterprise? That is absolutely something that we are very proud of. It is actually a unique differentiator of what we bring to the market. Uh, and with respect to M&A, obviously we can't comment on it. We'll continue to, we continue to monitor those things through our strategy organization. We'll continue to monitor technology trends. And if we see that there's something interesting we need to do, then you know we'll make the appropriate decision at the time. Okay, uh, uh, thanks, Peter. Actually, uh, Ragav has the the go to market, and uh, 
the, the channel to uh, for the private wireless network. So, Raghav, you, you want to take that or should I take the second question? Either way. I'll take it and I'll add to it if you want. Okay. Yeah. So, so in, in, this, uh, in this enterprise segment with the private wireless networks, we, we do expect uh, the margins to be better over time than in the CSP segment as we gain scale. Uh, it is still a very small business, but it, it's growing. And, uh, and this is based upon the leadership that we have in this segment uh, with, the, with the products and solutions. And we are able to drive better margin because there's more room to offer differentiated solutions. You see, it, it's like a tapping to a different wallet uh, in contrast to the traditional wireless services, which is really about basic connectivity and, and, and infotainment uh, for consumers uh, type of business. Uh, this is rather about uh, driving industrial productivity, uh, helping those industry verticals to, to automate their physical business processes. And that's where there's more room for differentiation. But uh, Raghav, back to, to you if you want to add. Yeah, I, I think you've uh, pretty much uh, laid it out. I think, uh, you know, we continue to see healthy margins. Uh, you know, when you look at private wireless, you look at campus networks, you look at wide area networks, and, and we continue to see, you know, good margins in this space. Uh, and these margins will only get better as we bring more industrial automation use cases as value addition over the private wireless network to really solve for very, very specific industrial automation use cases. And so that reinforces the value of the private wireless network to drive more value creation. And that's part of our enterprise strategy. That's helpful, thank you. Thank you, Peter Kurt. Next, let's go to the line of Stefan Slowinski from Exam. Great, thank you. Um, I had a question around the Google relationship uh, in particular because it seems increasingly strategic. I guess first, from an operational standpoint, will you be shutting down all of your data centers or you know, either owned or co-located and, and go completely into Google Cloud Platform? Um, and what impact do you see that having on, on CapEx going forward? What Google technologies will Nokia be adopting internally or embedding into your own products? And then secondly, what are those joint product or service initiatives that you're working on together and how will those work in practice? Um, will you have go-to-market um, collaboration in, in edge computing or 5G core or other areas? So any insight you can provide on that relationship would be appreciated, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. I think there's a two part question here. One is I think uh, the use of Google in our own environment and I think maybe Nishant can, would be better to answer that one. But if you want, I can take the, the other part of the question uh, first. Uh, I, I think I'd like to broaden the subject uh, really around, you know, much more the, 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 the larger web scalers. You know, we've been seeing, you know, Nokia has been working with many of the web scalers for a number of years, you know, where we've been hosting our software applications uh, on a, what is a strategy called an any cloud strategy where our customers can choose to take our applications and put it on any cloud infrastructure. What this has really enabled, uh, you know, is our customers to really participate and create value in the broader digital ecosystems. And they've really appreciated that. Uh, and that's, that's the openness that we have brought. The announcements that we've just made, you know, really extends our commitment, the cloudification of our portfolio. And most recently, the announcements really talk about extending this into Tommy's portfolio uh, you know, cloudifying the radio stack. And, and this really will allow our customers to actually engage in a much more bigger open uh, ecosystem to drive 5G use cases, value creation, and monetization opportunities. So this relationship with the web scalers is, is very, very critical in terms of bringing value and being able to participate in the broader, of creating value in the broader ecosystem. So with that, uh, you know, I'll pass it on to Nishant to, you know, to talk about uh, some of the, the, the second part of the question. Yeah, happy to. I think just to compliment one more thing that Raghav talked about, it is important to note, and you can pick several studies, uh, the traffic for a lot of enterprise use cases would be run off the edge. And we are really thinking about what edge platform is best suited because we sit on a gold mine of workloads and uh, Google may play 
uh, a part in that. So there's an aspect of that as well. Uh, then there is an internal digitalization strategy. And there, uh, to your question, we will not shut down all of our uh, private data centers. It will be a balance. We want to make sure that applications that Nick require uh, from, a, from a security and privacy perspective, uh, we will keep some on the private cloud and then migrate the rest to the Google Cloud. Uh, here, the strategy is twofold. We're looking at the applications as well as data center to data center migration. So we're looking at how can we shut down a few where the applications which are non-core and we can move it to the Google Cloud. Of course, here applications like enterprise resource planning would take much longer than some of the fringe applications, but uh, we're well on our way on that uh, migration as well. Great, thanks. And the CapEx impact? Uh, it's all already factored in. So uh, what you see in terms of guidance uh, that we provided, I, we don't see anything above and beyond that. In terms of our IT CapEx, it's also factored in and what Marco talked about. And this Marco, you want to add some more there? No, when it comes to CapEx in general, we have guided 2021, uh, 700 million. So it's a little bit increased compared to 2020. We had uh, just south of 500 million. Uh, but this body is, is quite small compared to the total capex. Uh, so the big increases that we have is actually coming from real estate, but also investments in uh, capacity, uh, especially in, in ASN, where we have an uh, extremely good order book and order intake uh, increase uh, in 2020. So we have to increase uh, the capacity in that uh, entity. Thanks, Marco. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Now let's move to the line of Simon Leopold from Raymond James. Thanks for taking this question. I, I wanted to follow up on the concept of open RAN and, and get your perspectives thinking out perhaps two to three years of how material do you see the market opportunity for Nokia and open RAN? And I'd also like maybe Frederico to follow up in terms of how you might have some follow through in optical and routing based on open RAN, uh, opening up perhaps some new market opportunities, maybe with the hyperscalers, for example, but broadly uh, your take on open RAN. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> I think this one comes to me. So um, thanks Simon. And uh, it, it's, it's too early to, to forecast exactly uh, how big the open RAN market will be, but, um, but for one authority, <laughs> Del Oro is estimating that uh, open run would represent some 10% of the overall run market in 2024, 20, 25, and 25% and a couple of years later. And uh, we, we see all run as, as an angle to, to take share. Uh, there are those 27 strong operators in all run alliance today, and, and they will be requiring all run compliance for, from the radio suppliers. And, if so, the suppliers are not all run compliant, they risk losing share. And, and for us to be strong in all run, that gives us the ability to then compete for more share. And, and then you have some operators out there who may need to adjust their supplier base. And all run is a good mechanism for them to, to change that, uh, that supplier ba base and increase supplier diversity. When that happens, obviously, uh, that market share will be spread across. And, and then the question is, who is ORAN compliant? Who is making that commitment to have ORAN compliant products, which is really the future way of doing radio business. So for us, you know, we can win radio business, we can win baseband, we can win both. Uh, actually, we expect that even if some operators require ORAN compliance in the contracts, uh, they may actually um, be still buying RF and baseband from the same supplier, at least for some time, and, and give that option or have that option. Thank you, as Simon. Per, oh, as, sorry. As per IP and transport, uh, we keep an eye on that because, uh, yeah, certainly uh, the, any hole that this might bring is still to be assessed, but uh, could uh, give us an opportunity. And also for fix, by the way, and that's one of the reasons why we are bringing 25 gig pond because uh, eventually when when the number of uh, cell sites grow with millimeter wave then you're going to need the point to multi point solutions as well in the in the front hole thank you and now thank you simon 
So our final question for today will come from Amit Harchandani from City. Please go ahead, Amit. Thank you. Um, since I'm the last one, if you don't mind me asking two quick well, like clarifications and a question, please. Um, my first clarification is on the technologies business. Why is the margin being guided at greater than 75% and not greater than 80%, uh, given that it's been above 80% over the last three years? A second quick clarification with regards to mobile networks. Are you factoring in the degree of pricing flexibility in order to offset your product, which is still being developed until it ends up becoming fully competitive. And for my main question, if I may, there are, I've heard the word pivot being mentioned across different sessions, and you have in fact pivoted the whole organizational structure. Clearly, a lot needs to go right for you to hit some of your longer term targets out to 2023. But if some of these pivots are not happening at a pace that you need them to happen, are you willing to take, undertake more drastic measures, including further restructuring, potentially divestitures? I guess, what's the degree of options on the table for you to hit the margin target for 2023? Or other way around, is this the plan that you're working with and there is no further steps that you could take to get to the target? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, can can we just show that? Yeah, yeah, Yenny, you go, Yenny, you go first. Ladies first. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So thanks, Amit, for your question. It was about the operating margin. So indeed, we, we guided today that the comparable uh, operating margin for 2021 and 23 uh, will be more than uh, 75%. Uh, additionally, uh, we have said that we continue to maintain our expectation for Nokia technologies to deliver um, a, slight a slight improvement in comparable operating profit in full year 2021 relative to 2020, and then stable performance over the long term with, with possible ups and downs from uh, year to year. So our current guidance is based on our current uh, visibility of the market. Uh, we have uh, successfully expanded our licensing base in recent years, and and I believe that, that we will continue to do so also going forward. Uh, at the same time, there are some uh, uncertainties relating to the market and, and deal timing, which make uh, it difficult to, to make uh, predictions. But, uh, but as you can see from our guidance, we see that Nokia technology is a highly profitable and sustainable uh, licensing business, and uh, we feel very good about it going forward. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not sure if I understood your, your question properly, but if uh, by uh, fra factoring in pricing flexibility, if you mean, if your question is whether we have had to sell our product as a, at the discount because uh, in 5G it hasn't been as competitive as we wanted, then the answer is not really. I mean, the, what, I, what I said about China is, is actually quite specific to China because of the mechanics of how the cent central purchasing rounds work. You have the technical ranking and then you have the the commercial round, et cetera, so not really. And then the, the question, question that, that you called the main main question, question. I mean, of, of course, course, now in this model, model and, and, and you have seen the plan, plan now the, the business groups are highly empowered to execute and they will, they will control all the resources that uh, they will need uh, to execute uh, uh, this uh, plan. But with that, uh, empowerment, empowerment comes, comes also a very high degree of accountability. We will not tolerate uh, businesses with uh, subscale sub -scale performance, and uh, in case there would be businesses within these groups uh, that would not meet the targets, we would uh, immediately uh, assess our uh, options. We will have a, a pretty high degree of uh, performance management and accountability applied to all uh, our businesses. And then uh, as the final final comment, again, from group strategy point of view, uh, this is now the main uh, plan, uh, accountable business groups. You have heard the plans. On top of that, we will always keep our options open and engage in active portfolio uh, management. Uh, that is not something that is the primary uh, plan in our case, but you can be assured that uh, in case uh, this plan does not lead to results, there will be other options uh, considered. And you will have seen actually in the restructuring announcement, 80 to 85,000, there is a 
5,000 gap. And uh, of course, the better we succeed in this plan, the better the top line uh, develops, the better the gross margin develops, the closer most likely we will uh, be at the uh, 5,000 uh, reduction. That already shows that, that if this plan does not get executed well enough, we already now have a readiness to do uh, more, and that's why we put the 10,000 number there as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Amit. And thank you again to all of you for your questions today. This concludes our second Q&A session and our event for today. To wrap up our Capital Markets Day, I would now like to turn the call back over to Pekka for closing remarks. Thank you, Matt, and, uh, and hey, uh, sincerely, thank you everyone for joining and, and asking all these highly relevant question and play, questions and playing your part in this uh, day, which, uh, which has been a big day for us. And uh, I fully understand if some of you, in a way, suffer from information overload. And uh, in case you want to revisit anything that we said today, all these presentations will very soon be available on Nokia.com. Before then, very quickly uh, recap, I would like to recap the very key points. First, our four new commitments. We are a trusted partner for critical networks. We focus on technology leadership in each of our business groups. We capture the value shift to cloud and new business models, and we create value with long-term research and intellectual property. Those are the four key commitments. Then my point number two, the three-phase journey of reset, accelerate and scale that you could see on the group level and then also in all business group presentations. This structure will help us to deliver on those commitments and return to sustainable, profitable growth. Uh, in fact, the reset phase began on day one of my time as president and CEO. And then the key point number three, all our business groups and functions are contributing to this journey and address it in ways specific to them. And as you have seen, they are all accountable and once again, highly empowered. And all are united by Nokia's new purpose and refreshed culture. As I said at the beginning, Nokia really is a great company. We have so much to be proud of. And the measures we have outlined today will help us build on that pride and create technology that helps the world act together for customers, for investors, and for our planet. Thank you. I would like to remind everyone that during today's event, we have made forward-looking statements, including but not limited to our future performance and financial results. Forward-looking statements are inherently subject to risk, uncertainties, and assumptions, and they are not guarantees of performance. I encourage you to read Nokia's filings with the SEC for a discussion of the risks that can affect Nokia's business, operations, and performance. We are under no obligation and expressly disclaim any obligation to update, alter, or otherwise revise any forward-looking statements except as required by law. Thank you for joining us today.